episode number 331, Importance of Recovery. I'm your host, Jeff Halish. This is our live show where we discuss the ins and outs of running your computer repair business. Our show today is brought to you by BusyBench, the all-in-one management tool simplifying IT for computer repair businesses with a clean and simple interface. Spend more time running your business instead of learning your management software. For a free 14-day trial, just go to BusyBench.com, use the offer code PODNUTS for 30% off the life of your account. And also by Untangle, next generation firewall. The best solution for bringing powerful network security to your clients in an easy to manage and cost-effective package. Untangle's partnership program helps repair shops add cybersecurity to their services and get up and running quickly. Get started today at untangle.com forward slash podnuts. Let me introduce the co-hosts. We have John Dubinsky from the Maven Group. John, how you doing? It's amazing to be here. Great to be back, Jeff. Thank you. Awesome to have you as usual. Hey, quick shout out to Bradford for or Brad for last week. He didn't throw me under the bus, which is kind of unusual. So thanks, Bradford. <laughs> See, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. I didn't instigate anything, so it's all good. Well, you didn't either, but it, I know that's coming. So I'll just <laughs> we'll just leave that. Well, I'll tell you what, before we do any of that. Why don't we go ahead and start with your plethora of tips and tricks for us? You know, I'm keeping it easy. It's summertime, summertime, so really easy. Um, actually, I have a client where I am troubleshooting some VoIP problems with my preferred vendor, so it's actually pretty awesome. They're heading out there Monday. They're going to put a tap on the network, see what's going on, because I can't seem to dig into. But uh, that thought made me think that perhaps that would be a good uh, tip to bring of the tools I use when I am troubleshooting VoIP. So in the show notes and in the chat are two quick tools. Um, one is called the SIP ALG detector. So SIP ALG is a networking setting that a lot of routers or uh, specifically, let me back up. In your router, 99.8% .8 of the time, you should probably have SIP ALG disabled especially if you're using VoIP. Uh, but most people don't realize that uh, ALG can also hide in your provider's modem, or in some rare cases, it can actually be in a managed switch as well. So you run this little SIP ALG detector on any workstation or server in your network, it will go out and it will test to see if it finds SIP ALG. And that will give you a heads up if maybe your provider's modem or you forgot to check the box on a switch or a router. The other thing that I used is a web-based tool that goes out and tests uh, your VoIP connectivity. It gives you what's called a MOS score. A MOS score is kind of a rating on how good your network will work with VoIP. And it does a bunch of other things. Uh, shows you some throughput settings and all that. And all of these are 1,000% free and easy to use for anybody. Even a level one tech could use them. And they produce some stuff that you could actually give back to your clients with a nice little cut and paste into an email or into your ticketing system. So that is in the show notes as well as the chat now. And that is my only tip for today. Very cool. Glad to hear that. And uh, yeah, I think it's, something good, it's a good tip or you're glad that it's only one. No, I'm glad that okay. it's a good tip because right. a lot of people are getting into VoIP nowadays and, and there's a lot of things to learn and there's a lot of extra things on your plate. And you need to know how to troubleshoot some of that stuff and find out uh, what's going on. So, well, uh, the other thing too is if you're dealing with a provider that isn't very helpful on the tech support side, running these tools will allow you to maybe narrow down what the problem is and point the finger where it belongs. Very good. All right. Let's talk about, I don't know, a conference that we have coming up. Oh, wait a minute. I probably should give a tip or trick, shouldn't I? Uh, kinda, we're I'm getting ahead of, I mean, it's in the chat. People are wondering why you haven't already. I'm so excited about the conference. So I'm going to do this a little different. We're going to talk about the conference right now because I'm excited about it. And it's coming up very, very, very quickly. And that is TechCon Unplugged, bringing the IT community together. Join like-minded business owners for a weekend packed with resources to help your IT business thrive. Hear from experts and get one-on-one -on -one time with peers facing the same challenges you are. Walk away with concrete action items to take your business to the next level. It's September 20th through the 22nd, 2019. It is a weekend. If you have not gotten your tickets, go over to techconunplugged.com. Get them now. They're going fast. I think we have, right now we have uh, over 71 people that are, are going to be at this conference. We're big time. So that's awesome. Um, really glad everybody's getting involved. 
And I think it's going to be a great time away from your business, a great time to learn and a great time to shake hands, share stories and learn from other people's experiences. And not only that, but share your own experiences because everybody has one that's a little bit different, which is kind of cool. And did I say where it is, John? John, where, where's the conference at? Lovely and beautiful Grand Rapids, Michigan, better than Florida. <laughs> you heard it here, folks, better than Florida. Absolutely. You know what, John, we're already starting to see the fall weather. When I was coming home today, I saw some leaves on the ground and I was like, oh, it's already becoming fall and it's like August. So beautiful. Well, weather. You know, it's, it's amazing to think that we're less than 30 days away. And honestly, if we, if we get, uh, don't get, there, don't get any rain. I mean, the weather should be absolutely fabulous for that. Time absolutely. Of year. And you know, the other nice thing though, get your hotel room at the hotel. It's at the Holiday Inn, Grand Rapids by the airport. It is 102 bucks a night. Everything's right there. The farthest walk, it, and you can drive if you want, but the farthest walk is literally a six minute walk across the street and down the way to Dave and Buster's for Saturday night dinner. We're doing everything all in one area. So it's, it's six be awesome. minutes if you don't hit the light green. If you got to wait for the white sign walk signal, that's six minutes. <laughs> so awesome. yeah, yeah, it should be great. And keep in mind, if you're listening to this on the day we're recording it, you have till the end of the month to get that hotel price. Yes, if that you is true. In September, the price goes up. I don't know what it goes up to. It could go up to one dollar more or a hundred dollars more. I, I'm, not, I'm not privy to that, but you got to get it in August to get the yes. discounted price. Yeah, get your. You can go in there, get a hotel room, buy your ticket, get signed up. Treat yourself to something where you can actually learn something in your business and hang out with the crazy people that we are. Well, me mostly, but, uh, <laughs> anyways, let's go back to, since we're done with that. And I was just so excited to get that out there and let people know, man, it is coming up and we've have very few shows left because, uh, next week is Labor Day weekend. And Labor Day weekend, we are not going to do a show because a lot of people travel and, and do different things during that weekend. So we're going to have a free weekend off there. Oh, so we've oh, always I, got I still get my pay, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because there's only two shows before the conference after that. I think it's the 8th and the 15th or something like that. 8th and the 16th, I guess it would be. So anyways, excited about that. But here is my tip. So I had a computer come in and it basically had a borked copy of Windows 8. And I don't think I shared this. I think I shared this with John, but I didn't share this on this show. So I'm sitting here trying to figure out, okay, which version of Windows 8 is it? I don't really want to put Windows 8 back on here. I really need to put Windows 10. So I went in and I did a Windows 10 install. Basically, I downloaded the, uh, the package from Microsoft put it on there, let it run, let it do its thing. And it at basically activated the computer without even being told, even though it, it never had Windows 10 on it. But be, I believe because it had Windows 8 on it, it was already activated. And so it was going to let you do that smooth upgrade. So if you ever run into those issues, um, my understanding is, and whether you like it or not, whether you think it's right or not, I'm not here to tell you that. But if you have a Windows 7 key, you can basically turn that into a Windows 10 installation. And I think just because Microsoft does not tell you about that doesn't mean that they don't want everybody over on Windows 10 because there's a lot of benefits on their side of supporting that. Plus, Windows 7, man, it's gone January 2020, right? Yeah, it's approaching fast. <laughs> kind of shocked me, too, when I... Uh, we did a little trip down to Florida with a couple of the tech brothers, and we were talking about this. So we were talking about all the computers we had to update. So all of us jumped in our RMM and did a little, or I jumped in my RMM and just did a little a lookup of all the Windows 7 boxes I have. And go, oh, okay, so enough said. I'm going to be busy. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It up on me. I didn't think I had that many, but I do have quite a few out there I got to get, get taken care of. It, now, John, for you and your businesses, taking care of a lot of dentists, orthodontists and stuff like that, obviously, you've probably got certain software that is not as compatible or wasn't as compatible with Windows 7. Well, you know, the little secret is or however it works out is a lot of the equipment, like maybe the doxies and their operatories and all that. The biggest transition is when we did that 32 bit to 64 bit jump. There was a lot of equipment that couldn't make that jump because the manufacturers didn't provide a new firmware. 
for like inaural cameras or x-ray sensors or stuff like that. Um, I haven't had a, load, a whole lot of trouble jumping from Windows 7 64-bit to Windows 10 64-bit with that same trouble, uh, same, same kind of trouble. Okay, oh, that's so, good. My, uh, knock on wood, all my migrations so far have been pretty smooth. <laughs> Oh, all right, John. So let's go into our main topic. And that is you came up with this title and I'm going to kick it off to you because we talked about importance of recovery and what that has, uh, what that has to do with the recovery of, I don't know, digital data. Is this recovery from a late night out? Or, uh, I want you to kind of explain what your thought process was when you, when you brought this topic to the show. I'm not sure if I brought this topic. Did I bring this topic? Yeah, you asked me about uh, if you wanted to do it a couple of weeks ago, but that's when you were down in Florida. It's I, I think understand. It, was Paco, it wasn't me, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think a lot of uh, techs in our field spend a lot of time focused on the backup and not a lot of time focused on the recovery. So um, there's a lot that goes into the backup in the solution you choose. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but this, uh, this show is going to be more about the considerations and what you need to consider when it comes to recovering, if there is some sort of disaster or data loss, um, and not just trying to figure out what you're going to do when that time arrives, when it inevitably does. So the idea is to prepare for that recovery now and take some considerations in mind before it happens. So when we're talking about, obviously everybody is, like you said, it's hot on the stick for backing up their systems, making sure their customers detailed data, whether it be QuickBooks, et cetera, et cetera, files, uh, artwork, whatever type of business they're doing, making sure all that's backed up. And we've talked about this discussion before of if you recover a file, a singular file and say, hey, the backup's working. I'm assuming I do that periodically, but I don't search through all the files to see if they're all, you know, if any of them are corrupted or any of them when I only use it once every 16 years and I go to open that file and go, oh, that file no longer works. <laughs> so how do you protect yourself against that? Because I think we, we kind of paint this backup as a 100% bulletproof idea that we can get 100% of your recovered software back every time. And I don't think that that is quite the case. Well, let's pump the brakes a little bit because what you're talking about is availability, which is extremely important when we're talking about recovery. But let's, let's start way at the beginning. So we have our backup in place, all right? And we're talking about our recovery now. And let's talk about the considerations that we put out there when we first chose our backup solutions. And th those are that we want to be able to identify, protect, detect, respond to, and recover from anything that's happening with our clients. And that could be a some sort of malware, some sort of ransomware infection. It could be somebody hitting delete. It could be just about anything. Um, so when we do that, we get into the types of media that we're backing up to if we started the back because that will have an impact on our recovery solutions. So if you're doing backups to optical, which are pretty rare now, but a lot of times what, I, what I'm reading is optical use, is still used for stuff that need really high or long lengths of retention. Like I'm gonna back something up, I'm gonna put it in a vault and come back to it 20 years ago, from now or 30 years from now. And that actually is special optical media. So out of my realm, so I'm gonna stop talking about it right now. Um, you could be backing up locally to a disk drive, whether that's an SSD, a spinner, or some sort of flash device. You could be still using tape. There are some instances where you still might want to use tape. Um, obviously, the really popular one now is to shoot that stuff up to the internet, up into the cloud. Um, or you could be using a combination of both, a hybrid backup, which is what I would su suggest. And you might be involving some sort of device, like a network attached storage or NAS device, or using a service like a data box which incorporates local and online backup as well. So you're taking all those considerations while there's even more. So let's talk about the types of backups you might be running. You could be doing a full backup. You could be doing an incremental backup, or you could be doing a differential backup. So depending on what you're doing, you know, again, you have to keep in mind what you're trying to recover. And don't forget about the length of recovery or the amount of retention that your backup solution has. 
Does your backup solution have a couple of days where you can get certain files back? Does it have a month? Does it have six months? Is it unlimited? And be careful what that term unlimited means. It's kind of like your cell service. Maybe your backup provider says unlimited, but they don't really mean it. <laughs> and the other consideration is, is what's, let's say you transition from one server to another. All right, are you still gonna pay for the storage of all those old backups that were done? Is there a way in your backup software to move those, your online provider, can you move those under a different endpoint so you still have all that backup history? Or what are you gonna do there? So with all of that in mind, now we can talk about considerations for backup recovery. Is there anything I missed there, Jeff, that you think? No, let's go back a little bit and let's talk about the different types of backup and sure. let's explain those as, as simply as possible because I'm not even sure that I get the differences all the time. I know two of them. The third one is always this weird hybrid <laughs> thing that's like, do I really need this or do I not? Well, I'm an old man and I'm Polish, so I always run full backups all the time. The only time I don't run full backups is if I do not have a time frame in order to do a full backup. Like um, if the customer only gives me an hour and I have gigs and gigs and gigs of change data to backup, I might only do a differential. But a full backup is just that. A full backup is one of the most basic backup types. And as the name says, you're just backing up every time you back up. You're backing up everything. And usually when you do a full backup, um, most backup software now isn't grabbing everything. It's only grabbing what's really changed behind the scenes. And if you have a really smart backup, um, it's only grabbing the blocks of data that have changed. So that makes it really quick. So I use Magnus Box as a backup platform in a lot of locations and it's doing a full backup every time. That's the way I have it set up, but it's only, it's only really grabbing what's changed, which makes this whole thing a little bit more confusing because then we get into what's called an incremental backup, which is just that. It only backs up things that have changed since the last full backup. Um, but then you get into differential, which makes it a little more confusing. It's very similar to incremental, but a differential backup copies all data changed since the last full backup every time it is run. All right, so incremental changes since the last backup. Differential, all changes since the last full backup. Does that make, is that clear? I mean, it's yeah. still kind of confusing. It, but your incremental only backs up the changes every time. With the way the differential is, if you run a differential, it will go back to the last full backup and still back up, up everything that's changed. And I'll tell everybody out there the best way to figure this stuff out, because I it's still, to, to put it into words, is somewhat confusing. What I would encourage you to do is probably on your own systems, actually try all three. And you'll see exactly what it's doing. Because I've done that on my NAS box not knowing what the differences were, trying different things to save space. And what I ended up doing was I learned basically what all three will do. I knew what a full backup was. That's like John said, that's probably the most basic, but the incremental and differential, it's like, yeah, it's a little confusing. So basically a, uh, an incremental is just going to do those last changes, but a differential does all the last changes before that. So maybe you back up, you do a full backup every seven days, let's say. And then you'll have this differential backup, which will be backing up to that last backup. But the incremental does it just only on the files in between. So well, anyway, the way to kind of explain this where you would actually use all three, um, a simple case scenario would be is let's say you just have a huge chunk of data. All right, whatever that size may be. So you may do your your initial full backup and you grab that. And let's say that backup takes seven or eight hours. So you obviously don't have a time period long enough with everything else that happens on a network to do a full backup, meaning a full honest backup every every night or every day. So then the way you might implement this, and there's a thousand different ways to do it, so this isn't cast in stone, is you might say, okay, I have my full backup. So Monday through Friday, I'm going to do incrementals to grab everything that changes. And then maybe Saturday, I say the office is closed, so I'm going to do a differential. So I'm going to get everything until my last full backup. So I got a differential backup. And then maybe Sunday, I do another full backup because the office is closed. I've got 24 hours, so I got that eight-hour window, so I'm going to grab another full backup. And then we rinse and repeat the next week. And if you really think about it, what that does is it gives you all these different backups with all these different versions of files to go back to in different restore points and different kinds of restore points, depending on what you need back. All right. 
And I think the key to that is you've just said it is you have all these different versions of these files. And what's cool about that is in this, in the case that I brought up before, if one gets corrupted in the transference from one to another, you're probably going to have different versions. You can go back to and retrieve that file as needed. And where this kind of makes this maybe in most solutions now makes the three types of backup a little mute or, or a little, um, I mean, it's kind of old tech. Cause if you remember, we used to do this all on tape and all that kind of stuff. And then we switched out media is the cloud has kind of changed this a little bit with block backup, meaning that little section where it only says if I have a word file and it's a hundred K and something changes, I only need point zero three K of that file because I just one letter changed or you added a period. So I'm just backing up that. And then with unlimited backup and a lot of aspects, I have a version of every change that's ever changed. So I don't really need to do incremental and differential because I have all those. Um, my only argument with that would be is, and we haven't really touched on what's an image backup, would be is you might want multiple versions of an image backup just because in case you have a bad image. All right, well, which would, you know, usually it's not catastrophic. You might just miss something, but if you had an image that was bad enough that you couldn't restore it, and I'll get back to what an image backup is or what I think I'm describing is an image backup. You know, if you had one that was catastrophically bad, you may have no image to restore. And what I mean by an image backup would be you take a complete image of, let's say, a server solution. So it you have the base OS, all your virtual machines, everything in one big image so that if something catastrophic happened and you just wanted to take that and maybe replicate it to a new box, you could take that image backup, uh, do a bare metal restore to either like or dislike hardware and have the exact same thing running on a different box. So, you know, we can put that off to a tertiary side, but uh, so now we have image backup, full backup, incremental, differential, and online with all its new features or modern features. And John, from your opinion, when you talk about image backup, would that be, is it as important? And I know anytime you do more than a singular type backup or you're putting more into backing up your customer stuff, obviously it's costing them more to make sure that this stuff is, is checked on and it's working and it's doing what it's supposed to do. So when you talk about a bare metal restore, that's basically a server going down and you basically can spin up either in the cloud or on another box. You can spin that server up and you're ready to go. So it's going to take whatever the last state that it saved of that particular server or computer system. That's what it's taking almost like a picture of. And that picture is going to be, it's going to be moved from what that image is going to be moved from one box to another or to a cloud solution that will be able to run. So it looks like nothing ever happened except the time in between when the image was snapshotted to the time that there was a catastrophic, uh, you know, thing that happened. Yeah. And I'm kind of smiling because what really, when you, when you say the topic importance of recovery, you know, it sounds like a pretty simple topic, but I mean, we've already gotten in the weeds already. And really, what I when I look at an image backup, um, I think about the pain, my pain, and the customer's pain. Um, you know, when I have a discussion with a customer, they obviously get that glazed over look. When we start, I don't talk about any of this stuff because they would either fall asleep or <laughs> soon we'd be talking about football or something. You know, they don't care about any of this. I say to them, well, what would happen if you couldn't use this machine for a day? What happens if you can't use this machine for three days? What happens if this machine is down for a week? You know, what's your pain threshold? And then I say, okay, well, if you need this up in an hour, it's going to cost this much. If you need this up in a day, it's going to cost this much. If I have a week, it's going to be this much. So, and then any solution I put in anywhere is it doesn't make my job easier because the math always equal my job easier equals customer better, more satisfaction. My job's easier, customer's more satisfied because then I can spend my time on project work. I can spend my time on improvements and I'm not worried about any of this because it just works. Um, so again, that's been kind of come on under one of our considerations is restoration. But, uh, you know, you started. Is there anything else we want to add to this before we get into this? I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and take a quick break and then All we'll right. go back into we can gather some thoughts and you can drink your tea or whatever you're drinking. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll go back into. Topic. You know, it's it is a fascinating topic. So um I'm I'm very interested to see the thought process of of yourself and, and the different people out there. So 
Our show today is brought to you by Busy Bench. Remember when running your business was simple? Busy Bench sure does. Wouldn't it be nice to quickly create a repair ticket, generate an invoice with a single click and manage thousands of customers completely free of charge? Busy Bench thinks you will enjoy adding an unlimited number of customers, invoices, estimates, and inventory items so much you might forget we have paid features too. But don't worry, when your business grows and you need things like SLA alerts, payment processing, and recurring subscriptions. BusyBench will be with you every step of the way. Turn a ticket into an invoice with a single click. If you added inventory items to a ticket, they will be added to the invoice as well. Makes life easy peasy. The new invoicing module allows you to track when a customer opens an invoice and determines when it was viewed. No more of that. Did you get my invoice? What invoice? The one that you opened three times. Yeah, that invoice. Yeah, go ahead and pay that, would you? Additionally, customers can pay that same invoice online. How awesome is that? Manage your assets with predefined metrics and customization options. Easily track everything from customer serial numbers to logon passwords and device details from a single location. Receive daily digest recapturing all your activities such as tickets created, invoices generated, and payments received. Go to busybench.com and start your free account today. When you decide to upgrade, use the offer code PODNETS for 30% off the life of your account. All right, John. So we have talked about the different ways that you can obviously back up your system. And I assume that now we're going to kind of rotate that into what, why is it important to figure out what's recoverable, how to recover and everything in between? Well, you know, and Rick, uh, Rick Tech brought up a good point. You know, there's always paranoia. Like he says, he's got two backups on two media stored in two locations, blah, 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 blah. And absolutely. You know, if I can convince the customer to do more backups, you know, it allows me to sleep better at night and perhaps I'll start growing hair again. It would be great. But, you know, and I'm even to the point where maybe if you have a user that uses QuickBooks, maybe train them to do a local backup, even to their documents directory of the QuickBooks data, depending on, you know, what's happening there. Even though you're doing a backup of this uh, data that's on the server and all that, you know, it's never bad to have them have a local backup. You know, it's easy to shoot from the QuickBooks software. Why not have one more copy somewhere that you could go back to just in case bad things happen? You know, John, here's here's a funny thing. And this is a side story with that, where I had a particular customer that had QuickBooks and we're trying to figure out, okay, we need to back this up. And all of a sudden I went, I was looking at the files and I was like, wait a minute, why is there no backups here in what's going on? We were doing a local backup when Carbonite actually used to do a local image backup. So that was good. And we did the cloud backup. So everything was being backed up in two different places. Everything's wonderful. Carbonite got rid of that. So I had to figure out a way to basically back up the QuickBooks files locally, because obviously they were being backed up in the cloud, all that stuff that was already being backed up, not a big deal. And I had to basically set it up. Now, here's the thing. If you don't close QuickBooks, which I can't believe there are so many people who don't, they leave it open on your system 24 seven, never shutting it down. It will not back up. You have to close it in order to get that backed up. So that comes down to training the end user on what to do because they're kind of getting in their own way of backing up their stuff. Well, I don't want to go far too far into the backup weeds because this is, this might be another good show to talk about. Um, but you know, it's not auto magic. And, you know, that, that term we'd like to use, you know, I talk to my clients all the time about, hey, if you have a vendor, a third party vendor that comes in and adds something new, you know, one of the questions on your sheet should be, do I need to back up anything? And the other question or other thing you need to do is maybe let me know so we can add it to the backup, you know, because I've had that happen before where customers called and said, hey, we need XYZ resort. And I say, what the heck is XYZ? You know, and I, they said, well, we added that about six months ago. And I said, I didn't know that. So you didn't get it backed up. So, you know, it all depends. You know, so there's got to be some constant communication. I haven't solved that puzzle yet. Um, but, you know, that's always consideration. Just like you said, user training, customer training uh, and training for us just to stay on that type of thing. Um, you know, and Ken in the chat makes a good point. You know, he's using a great solution, a data solution. And he even had a problem with uh, their image not restoring. So he's working with data support right now. And I'm not throwing data under the box because I would consider them one of the premier solutions. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, even with a premier solution, it always doesn't work 100%. So it's something to keep in mind when we start talking about the importance of recovery. 
and that is a very good point. So why why is it important to figure out in what what is recovery? What is recovery of a are we talking about recovery of a file, all files, some files? What does it actually mean? Well, in in my mind, recovery is getting back to the point where you were before whatever happened. happened. Right. Before it happened, you know. So here, hold my beer. Can we get back to before the point where I said, hold my beer? Um, you know, th- that is my recovery, my recovery point. Um, at, can I get back to this point in time at this day in this type, whether the office is totally gone and I'm setting it up in somebody's basement because they're finding some other space to lease to continue business. Um, I guess th- the important part is in my mind is the recovery is not having to have that conversation with your customer that says, we don't have any of that. We, we can't do that. We don't have that. So, um, you know, the first thing is everybody says, test your backups. And I always, yeah, absolutely. Test your backups. I test, uh, actually do manual backup quarterly for all my clients restore, but I don't do a whole full restore. I go out and grab a couple of files and I go out and see, look at the logs and I just see if I can get everything. Uh, there are solutions that have some automated uh, data will spin up a, an image and show you that it can restore an image or show, shows you that the backup could be go, could be taken live at any time. But obviously, we just had an example of that where that didn't totally work. Um, I guess in my opinion is you just have to do some due diligence just so you don't get caught with your pants totally done, down. I mean, backups fail. That's why we have multiple backups. That's why you should have... Uh, on a server, I you know, RAID's not a backup, but it gives you a second chance. If there's a hardware failure, you should have some sort of local backup. You gotta have some sort of offsite backup, uh, you know, wherever that is. So your data is redundant in a couple different places. And that's merely to give you chances. Again, I go back to that simple thing of what you mentioned, you know, just do a lousy little QuickBooks backup to a local desktop. Cause you know, if the server goes totally bad and your backups are hosed, I mean, at least that's a piece you can get back because you found a backup on a desktop. So, you know, again, you know, Rick mentioned, you know, redundancy and backup and all that kind of stuff, extremely important. And again, roll it back, makes your job easier because you can find that data and therefore your customers will be happy. But specifically considerations for backup recovery. And we started the show with availability. Is the data available for you to restore? So is the cloud service up and running? Can you get to it to restore the data? Do you have the media that you backed up to? Let's say you're still going old school and you got uh, rotated hard drives because the customer has absolutely no bandwidth to do a cloud backup. Does Barb have the hard drive at her house? So you need to do the recovery and you can't get to it. So there's no availability. Um, You know, making sure that you can get to that data that is available for you to restore, that that's not delaying you. And that kind of ties into the speed of restoration. It is much easier to do a data restore from a local hard drive. It can be a lot faster, you know, coming back over that USB 3 channel or across your gigabit network from your data or NAS than trying to download 120 gigabytes over a 3 megabit T1 connection. You know, so a local backup is always easier and keep in mind that that's going to constrain your speed of recovery. If it's just a data recovery and you tell the customer, well, we lost all that data at hand. It's all backed up, but we have to delete all this because it's encrypted due to ransomware. I've started the download and it looks like it'll be done on Monday and today's Monday. And I'm not talking about today, Monday, I'm talking about next week, Monday. So, because you only have a limited bandwidth to download that and maybe your provider, this is another thing to reach out to is, does your provider have a service? Will they overnight you a hard drive with all that data on it? Is that a conversation you need to have with your online provider? Um, it's uh, And I'm, I'm speeding through a lot of this, but I had a great conversation with B where he mentioned that Datto down in hurricane season or when there was a hurricane, I mean, there were Datto trucks down there to help you get your Datto back, your uh, recover your data. So in partnership, if you're a Datto partner, you know they'll actually spin up a vehicle to come down there and help you get your data back. So that is pretty amazing as well. Now you pay for that. Maybe your customer's not willing to pay for that, but that is a good uh, good consideration. Availability and that speed of restoration. Which well, also- John, when you Go talked ahead. about you talked about the different uh, amounts of money that these services obviously cost, and really, when it comes to the customer, the customer they want it done yesterday, but they want to pay for it 
for months down the road <laughs> when you can actually get them back up and running or, you know, whatever that is. So it's, it's, it, it is a hard conversation, but I think John, you, you, you put it out there best because you said, Hey, what is your, what would happen if you had no use of server computer, whatever it is, one day, two days, one week, two weeks, what's that going to look like for you and your business? And then the customer can kind of answer that question and figure out, okay, here's what I want. Okay. Here's what it's going to cost. Well, maybe I can do, do without that. And I can, I can wait a few days, worst case scenario. Okay. Well, here's what that's going to cost. Well, I, May, a week would probably be fine. So well, let's, walk, well, let's walk through that example. Here's a great <laughs> example. So you go to your dentist and you're sitting in the dentist chair and you, the, your hygienist sticks something in your mouth and they take an x-ray. So like a bite wing x-ray or something like that. That's a simple x-ray. And usually that x-ray is shared <clears throat> among one or two operatories. So if that op goes down, they simply move to another op and they take another x-ray. So that might be something where, yeah, it might be painful today if that x-ray was down or that app was down, but it might not be worth an extra couple hundred dollars a month to make sure that we could get that back. But what might be important is if you were an orthodontist and your panoramic x-ray went down. Now, what a panoramic is, if you've never had this, is that it's the one big machine. You go st almost stand in it and they have a mouth guard in it and it spins around your head and it takes a panoramic x-ray of what's going on. And an orthodontist needs this in order to, to do a treatment plan and see what kind of braces you need and basically to get you a price quote. So if that's down, that's kind of a key to an orthodontist doing business. So that might be worth a couple hundred dollars a month to make sure that I can spin that machine up quickly. I actually have a couple orthodontists where we have a duplicate computer just kind of set off to the side. So if anything happens, you know, I can roll the truck, pull the hard drive out, put the hard drive in the other box and we're good to go. You know, so we, tr we try to, you know, remediate the solutions or have a backup plan, quote unquote, in place before that even happens. So, you know, again, it goes back to that pain threshold. Very good. All right. Sorry. I didn't mean to pull you off topic. I was just thinking Stop about talking about backup. We're talking about recovery. I know. We're, we're back to recovery now. So I am recovering, I'm recovering, listening to you talk. Oh, okay, so <laughs> not talking for me today. <laughs> we need another guest next time. <laughs> no, but this is good because I think there's a lot of confusion out there when we talk about recovery, what it is, what it looks like to us, what it looks like to the end user, and what's important for us to convey, maybe little to the end user, but what's important for us to think about because I think there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to testing recoveries, making sure that they're working right. And so let's go ahead and get into the weeds on that a little bit. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the considerations for backup re or for recovery. <clears throat> and the next one I would put in the list is called reliability or trust. And I'm going to wrap into this, what I would call simplicity as well. So your customer calls you and they've just had a disaster. Let's, let's say the rate array in the server is just fried. Your back plane's dead. It fried the drives. I mean, there's nothing. So what you're going to do is you're going to put a new backplane in your server and you're going to get some new drives. You're going to have the server like you just took it out of the box without an OS. All right. At this point, you'll know you have a good backup recovery process in, in place is are your armpits sweaty or are your armpits not sweaty? All right. If your armpits aren't sweaty, then you have a backup process and solution in place that you trust you know, it's reliable and it is simple to do because, you know, you're going to roll in there. You got your drives, you got and you know, you have your data and your backup solution and you're going to restore that server. And possibly you could have it up in an hour, depending or a couple hours, depending just on how much data you get to transfer and where you get to transfer it from. So reliability, trust, simplicity of that solution, you know. Are you panicking as much as the customer is because you're not sure if you can get that data back or it's not a big deal? You know, you're going to roll the truck and in an hour or two, you're going to look like the hero. You're going to high five everybody on the way out and life is going to be great. So that's a big consideration for your recovery. If, if you don't feel that you can get it back every time, you do not have a good recovery plan. And how, and how would you set up a, a good recovery plan? Where would that start? 
A good recovery plan or to test that is, I mean, it's not very expensive to buy a refurbished server, throw the drives in it, uh, just do a simple install of Windows Server on it. You don't even need to buy a license. Just do the test version, which works for 90 days, put some data on it, and break it. When usually the easiest way to break it is just pull the drives you have in there out, put some new drives in it. Now you're at zero. See if you can recreate exactly what you just built and how long it takes you to do that. I mean, that's very easy to do. Uh, and if that is a complex process for you, then your recovery solution is not good either. You know, <laughs> that, that it shouldn't be that hard. All right. Um, you know, data makes it pretty easy. A couple of clicks, um, like you can spin it up in the cloud and the customer can be up depending on which solution you're using from them. But let's say the customer doesn't want to do that. They're price conscious and cost is the ex actually the exact next thing on my list. You know, you can do this with Windows Server Backup. All right, the biggest weakness of Windows Server Backup is it's tough to monitor remotely. Um, you know, you can watch the event logs and all that kind of stuff, but you know, there's not some pretty control panel to tell you red, green, yellow. So you, you got to build it kind of yourself. But I do have a, a couple of customers that use Windows Server Backup and I've restored from it successfully without issue. So would I consider that my primary backup? I might use it as my primary as for a simple image backup. But, you know, I always make sure I have a tertiary, you know, online backup of the data just in case I have to start from scratch. But, you know, the data, it would be my number one concern because I can get back from that. It just might be slow because I have to rebuild something. Um, and keep in mind, the cost of what you want to do might has not might has a lot to do with the solution you're backing up. So let's talk about the servers we might have in place really quick and how that fits in here. If you have a small dental office, let's say five or six users, and you have quote unquote a server, perhaps you just have a work group server in there that doesn't have active domain or active directory, group policy, all that kind of magic going on. It's just purely a work group server because it's just a tiny little network and they don't need that complexity in there. <clears throat> you know, that's a pretty easy to re server to re restore from, even if you have to build it from scratch because there's very few new users you got to set up. There's no active directory configuration. You don't have to retach any of the computers. I mean, that's pretty easy. On the other hand, if you have a larger office and maybe you say have 30, 40, 50 users, <clears throat> Marvin has some great examples of this where he might have 15 servers and they're all scattered around and they all play different roles within the forest and the domain of the network. You know, to rebuild one of those from ground zero is going to be painful. So his backup solution or anybody's backup solution in that kind of scenario, you better be able to get back from ground zero with, and get that image back completely so that you're not spending the time of re reattaching the domain, reattaching all the clients, doing that AD reconfiguration, all that kind of stuff. So again, what is your recovery solution and how does it fit what you have going on at the client? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So <laughs> there's so many things to think about and it's hard to keep some of that stuff straight in your head. And I, and I guess you've got to pick what you're, what you're most comfortable with, with the, with the type of customers that you're going to take on. Cause obviously you're not using one backup solution for all your customers. Sounds like you have a hybrid approach depending on the customer's needs. And you have the customer has to have different expectations on the recovery process because of that. Maybe some of their some of these solutions are cheaper, some are more expensive. Now, answer this: If somebody loses their data, they pretty much lose their mind, no matter what they're paying for. Correct? Well, that's <laughs> usually not a conversation <laughs> I like to have. You know, back when I used to do some uh, home clients or when I started and I had more residential clients, <clears throat> you know, I think it's been probably two or three times where I've had a mom crying on my shoulder because, you know, I didn't know who they were, but I get the call to show up and their hard drive's dead and they've had every picture of their children and their children are now grown, grown and gone and now they're all gone. You know, so, you know, th that's just a simple type of example, you know, we're not talking about a business going out of business and employees losing their jobs and you 
possibly being litigated against and, you know, all this other stuff. So, you know, you're just that good of a host. But my last item on my recovery list is client communication. And really what you need to tell the client is I'm only doing what you tell me to do. It's your disaster plan that I'm following. You create the plan. I'll create it with you, I'll help you, but I'm not going to create it for you. And then we need to follow that plan together. So i.e. you add new software, I need to know about it so we can add it to the backup. Um, and then like anything else, you better have your little documentation that says, hey, backup doesn't work. It's not my fault. You know, although you better be doing your due diligence and checking those backups and verifying those backups and, you know, Obviously, we're good people, so we want our customers to succeed. We don't want to lose a customer due to data loss. That would be horrible. And I think we've all been in the place where we've gotten the call because the old guy couldn't get the data back, or our backups haven't been running for years, and we can't get a hold of the other guy, or you know, all those excuses. You know, let's not be that guy. Let's not be a, the trunk slammer, like Paco said in his last show. <laughs> yeah. Now, when we talk about things like the recovery process and the, and the things that we need to think about, what about checking? I'm going to go back to backups, but the, I, I believe this is in part important of the recovery process. How often and how do you check your backups to make sure that they're actually backing up and doing what they need to do? Well, I monitor, monitor my backups daily. Um, you know, good, better, best as far as was there a problem? What kind of problem was there? You know, do I have green, yellow or red? My backups are good. You know, at least my console is telling me that my backups are running. Am I yellow? My backups ran, but maybe I missed a file or two or there's something wrong. Maybe maybe the SQL database didn't shut down correctly, so I didn't get everything in there. Is there something I need to check out or is it red? Did my backups just fail? Do I have a failure type of report that I need to stay on top of? And that's great. That's part of that. And my absolute last uh, uh, item is automation. So, you know, that's part of that automation you want to put in so that, uh, you know, you're getting that tap on the glass that says, hello, I have a problem. Uh, and then we do that quarterly. I do that quarterly for all my clients that are a rotating reminder I get in my calendar that says, hey, it's time to go look at ABC Company's backup. And usually what I do is I just do a one file restore. And I just go in there. You know, it's not quite that simple. I go dig in. I see, you know, I go look at the timestamps on the files, you know, and I might pick a couple random dates where I go back. And usually, I'll explain my process. Usually what I do is I locate one file that I know is really important. It might be a QuickBooks file or something like that. And then I go back and I say, all right, uh, it's been a quarter since I've done this. Let me check three or four times. Can I see? And I know this file changes every day. So can I see it on this last Thursday? Can I see it on the Wednesday before that? Can I see it on the Tuesday before that? And then I might grab that one and bring it down and just make sure I can get it and see it. And I have a file, you know, so usually that's my little verification on, on my simple cloud backups to say, yes, hey, look, I looked out there. I got three or four versions of this file, feeling pretty good about it. And I downloaded this one, a restoration process is working. And I go to the dashboard and I'm all green lights. And in my dashboard, I can see all the backups that have run the history of them. And they're all green. And I, you know, there hasn't been this consistency of problems. You know, if you're looking in your backups and you're green, yellow, 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 green, yellow, green, yellow, green, red, 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 green, you know, <laughs> come on, there's probably a problem. You know, maybe it's a laptop and the user's just sporadically all over the place. That's one thing. But if that's a server that's always on and you're getting that, you know, it's probably something for you to look into. Very good. And last but not least, you know, when we're talking about recovery is, can you automate that recovery? Is there a way to automate that? Um, and there's a lot of as different aspects to automating a recovery. Data would be a great example. It's not full automation, but quote unquote, a couple of clicks and you can spin that data up into the cloud and they can have a server in the cloud. Uh, and when I say automating recovery, is it easy maybe to give your your technical contact at a customer a way to restore simple files that's easy for them and not complex? So you don't have to open a ticket or it can be easy for them if you have a tech champion at a site or any way that you can just automate this so that you're not getting dinged all the time that you need to do a single file restore or something like that. I deleted the document I was just work, working on Can you yesterday. Can you get that back for me today? Yeah. Who hasn't heard that, right? Exactly. All right, John, let's take uh let's gather up any more thoughts that you might have and let's take another quick break. 
And now uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this wonderful topic that you did bring to us. And I will show you the proof later. Uh, <laughs> our show brought to you today by Untangled Next Generation Firewall. Designed to provide your small to medium business customers with the easiest, most cost-effective solution for network security. Untangle is the fastest way to add cybersecurity to your service offerings. We've taken enterprise-grade security and put it into a platform that makes it easy to get started risk-free. There's no steep learning curve with Untangle, which I really enjoy. Instead, you'll get a browser-based dashboard that will let you see the status of your managed networks at a glance. You'll enjoy on-the-box reporting included at no extra cost plus customizable alerts that integrate easily with apps like PagerDuty and VictorOps. Make it simple to stay on top of any incidents that do occur. Untangle NG Firewall not only protects your clients with gateway antivirus, spam blocking, and intrusion prevention, but also gives you control over traffic at the application level with web content filtering, app control, and full SSL inspection. You also get WAN optimization features like balancing, failover, and bandwidth control. Whether you need a VPN options or a captive portal for secure Wi-Fi, Untangle NG Firewall has everything you want in a single solution. With lots of freebies like centralized management with zero-touch provisioning and a cloud threat intelligence scan for a second layer of defense included at no extra cost. There's no better choice than Untangle for getting visibility into and control over network traffic. Helping your clients safely connect to the internet for their business-critical applications. Visit Untangle.com forward slash podnuts to get a free no obligation trial of ng firewall and save 15 percent on any purchase with promo code podnuts all right john is there anything else on that wonderful list that we've not talked about when it comes to recovery well, there's a lot of caveats and there's a lot of uh, it depends answers that go on with backup <laughs> and recovery because your solution is going to vary, vary depending on what you're backing up and how important it is to get it back. Whether it's your residential tech and you're backing up mom's pictures or dad's music and movie collection, um, you know, which com sometimes can be trickier than backing up business data just to the sheer volume that you need to shoot up somewhere or try to back up for somebody. Or, you know, if it's a complex business environment, you know, you've got multiple servers at multiple locations running possibly different OSs and have different imaging or image software and virtual machines on them. So, you know, there's a, a, a lot of intricacies on backing up. But what we talked about today is definitely the base of any solution when it comes to recovery. You know, the availability, speed of restoration, your recovery time, reliability and trust, the simplicity of the solution, the cost of that solution, and communicating with your client. I like it. And John, is there anywhere that people could, in a safe environment, maybe ask a question and get an answer to something like, hey, would this be a good solution for my client as far as backing up and recovering? You know, Jeff, there just happens to be a place. And if you make that $1 a month contribution to the CRP group uh, over on Patreon, uh, Jeff will let you into the CRP group where you can ask all sorts of dumb questions that I've asked before and gotten very good answers to. We all have questions that need to be answered and everybody is at a different point. And not only that, even those of us that have been around for a long time, sometimes we forget and got to go back and answer, you know, ask the simple questions to go, how did I do that like 10 years ago? So yeah, if you, if you want to support this show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast. And I want to thank our newest Patreon supporter. And that is Martin Greville Giddings. And I want to thank all of our Patreon supporters for your continued support. It's a little more than a dollar a month. Just so you know, it's, we usually do between two and four to maybe even five episodes in a month's time, but it's a buck a show. Buck and, a show is what I meant. Yeah. I digress. <laughs> And that'll get you in the super secret Facebook group where you can ask those questions in a nice environment. And John and I were just talking about this before the show started about a thread in, we won't mention where it was at on another, uh, I don't know, it was a forum or, or something like that, where there was six pages of answers that had nothing to do with the question that the person was asking. And we definitely frown upon that in our group. So anyways. Good place, good, safe place to ask those questions. John, we got anything else for this week? 
No, I think that's pretty good. Pretty clear, pretty concise. Um, I don't think I have anything else to add. That wouldn't just be gibberish. All right. Sounds good. And why don't you tell people where they can find you at if they wanted to talk with you or, you know, chat about recovery? Well, it seems like I get into the CRP group every day, so I'd love to see everybody there. Uh, that's a great place to do it. Or just ask me in person when you come to TechCon. There you go. I like both those answers. All right. Come join us live for the Computer Repair Podcast every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern over at podnets.com forward slash CRP live. Join in on a conversation by hanging out in the chat room. You can send an email to podnuts at podnuts.com. And guess what? We'll read that on the air. I want to thank everyone for listening and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time on the Computer Repair Podcast.